hey everybody are are you hot are you like over this heat already and we're just hitting july 4th do you want to learn all about delicious refreshing recipes that you can enjoy this summer well of course you do so thank you so much my name is virginia willis and welcome to cookbooks with virginia this is a live stream cookbook review show that runs every Friday at 11.30 a.m. And I say it's a cookbook review, but it's not really a review because I only have books and people on the show that I love their books and I like the work that they do because why bother with talking about something that's not any good, right? So we have got today, I'm so excited. It is perfect. So we have got Eat Cool with Vanessa Cedar, and it is a phenomenal book. So let's get going. We've got 100 easy, satisfying, and refreshing recipes that won't heat up your kitchen. This is exactly what you need this summer. Let's say hello to Vanessa. Hi. Hey, Vanessa. Hi. How are Thank you? I'm good. Thank you so hey, much hi. for joining us today. Thanks for having me. This is so fun. I'm so glad to be here. It's so, I think it's just great. It's cool how um, in the past, you know, year and because of the pandemic, like more of these online things are happening because you're in Maine right now, right? I am. I'm in Portland, Maine. And you're and, in Portland. Uh, I, I know. I know. We're like at opposite end, literally opposite ends of the coast. And I think that this weekend is actually supposed to be fairly cool in Georgia, oddly enough. But as you know, so much of the country is in a heat wave. Yeah, we've been having a heat wave here in Maine. I mean, it's been so uncomfortable. And surprisingly, this is the first day where it's rained and it's a little bit cooler. So, yeah, um, yeah. Yep. Well, I, y'all, so let me just tell you about where to go. So, we've got this book. If you go to my Instagram feed, you're going to see the cover of Vanessa's beautiful book. And you're going to like me and like Vanessa and you can enter to win. You're going to tag a friend, follow the instructions there, and you can enter to win a copy of Vanessa's beautiful book, Eat Cool. So Vanessa, it's perfect. Like I love, it all just screams fresh. That's all I could think about. It's like fresh and crunchy, fresh and crunchy. Yeah, that will, this came from a very real place of being very uncomfortable a couple summers ago, you know, mm -hmm. we moved my husband and I, we moved um, from Brooklyn, New York, actually. We moved uh -huh. to Portland, Maine, 2011. We had a whole list of reasons why we were ready to move. And one of them was just a more temperate climate. You know, we yeah. were ready for less heat and humidity. But surprisingly, you know, Maine, every summer it's getting hotter and warmer and the seasons are yeah. longer. And, yeah. Um, and I was working on the editorial calendar. So I was working on, like, fall and winter stuff. <laughs> It was so hot. <laughs> I was in a it's always crazy show. with that. It's always so crazy with that. I literally, I think it was two weeks ago, I was working on Thanksgiving. Yeah, right. I mean, that's how it works, right? And I yeah. actually, I've been working on a bunch of uh, squash, roasting squash recipes right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fall, winter stuff. And it's been so hot, so I'm reliving it again. So no, I know. It's well, that's helpful. It's, I know it's really crazy. So you have, so y'all, this book is packed with recipes. You've got breakfast, small plates, salads, soups, toasts, sandwiches, main course, desserts, drinks. I mean, you've got a little bit, you've got a little bit of everything. So it's not just, you know, it's, it's not just one thing or the other. I mean, a cool weather breakfast. Y'all look at this beautiful green shakshuka. Wow. That looks delicious. So Vanessa, tell us a little bit about how you came to find these recipes, how you, you know, what was yeah. the, like you were in your kitchen and you're hot and you're just like, I need, we need some cooler recipes. Yeah. I mean, I, I was working on, on fall foods and, and fall and winter things. And um, first of all, at the end of the day, I didn't want to eat any leftovers of that. I just, my body was craving more liquids, things that were lighter, uh, more vibrant. Um, mm -hmm. In the summer, in general, we try to shop at the farmer's market as much as we possibly can. You can get the best quality ingredients there. You're, support yep. you're supporting your local farmers and everything. So at night, I would just I just started cooking for my family in the morning. Um, we have a daughter who's eight, and um, I just cook what felt right to me. And then I was thinking back. 
because I, I've worked in this industry for for quite a while at this point. Um, yeah. I guess since 2003. And um, I was just thinking back to like all those other stories I've worked on and, and people's books I've helped with and all this stuff. And I'd never quite come across anything that was really food to keep cool. I've, come, I've worked on a lot of summer issues and, you know, smoking outside for long amounts of time and, um, you know, grill, barbecue, heavy foods that actually don't cool you down. So I right. kind of explored this concept and I thought it would be helpful for people. Ultimately, that's my goal. It is. Yes. But and, um, it really is. I think that that is the goal of pretty much like every food editor, every like so many cookbook authors, you know, it's approachability, accessibility and to get people to eat together. Like that's like our, you know, how can this, yes. how can we make this happen? How can we like, I mean, you know, not that it's like completely the evil empire, but how do we keep people from just going to the drive through or like making making poor choices, you know, and it's so much better for, for the food and everybody to, to eat together, you know, yes. even when it's, even when it's hot. Well, I love the breadth of um, recipes and it, you've got um, so many different influences. So it's not just like you're in Portland. It's not just like Maine food. Um, you know, it's not, you, it's very multicultural. Yes. That's very important to me. I believe we're all connected and we can learn so much from other cultures and how everybody eats and the history of food. It's all intertwined and we all have to eat. Yep. And I believe that, you know, cooking and eating is just really a life skill that people should know and celebrate and bring people together. That's just how I feel. Um, and I grew up in Los Angeles, actually. I'm not a right. Um, so the, the history in Los Angeles, it's less European. It's more like Hispanic and Asian. Um, I, I lived for a summer in Japan. I went to Japanese school when I was little for a while. <laughs> like, wow. So I, I'm really influenced by those cultures as well as European cultures as well as African, Indian. Like, mm -hmm. It's just all really important to me. So no, I, I think that that's great. And I think that that's, um, I mean, I was reflecting on it when I was looking through your book, because, you know, I'm known for writing these Southern books, but I'm French trained. And it's like, but of course, I eat, I eat a wide variety of foods. I like to cook a wide variety of foods. You know, I don't pretend to be an expert in Japanese cooking or an expert in Thai cooking, but I still appreciate, I still appreciate a good recipe. And so it feels like to me that you have um, the authenticity there, but it's also accessible. It doesn't require like, you know, a ton of online shopping or shopping at exotic markets and stuff. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely that, but I mean, there are a few recipes where you might have to go to an Asian market or, you know, a specialty market, but I do try to keep it accessible after working so long in this industry. I know that everyone lives in a different place and they're not able to get everything they need. So I think, um, just in general, like in terms of recipes, as long as they're not like um, a baking recipe where it's more scientific and you yeah. have to have the exact measurements and everything. I think there's like a little bit of flexibility and it's like a loose blueprint when you're making yes. some of these recipes and it should be, you know, it should be fun and, you know, it should be something that anybody can do. I want my book to be messy. I want people to stay in the book. That's I love cool. that. I love that. No, it's a beautiful thing. So this is something that I thought was really fantastic. You have this wonderful like spread. Let me hold this up about 10 seafood. And I think that that is so smart and makes so much sense to be able to, um, cause it's great to have like some delicious 10 seafood that you can use as a protein with some refrigerator items. Will That's you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. Um, well, of course there's the cheese board, you know, everyone loves a good cheese board. I absolutely love cheese, love yep. cheese board, but when it's really, really hot out, yeah. you kind of want to cut down on your high fat alcohol, sugar. Those are things that, um, cause your body to work harder to break down. So ultimately that's gonna heat up your body more. So this is a really great option when you have friends coming over, it's 102 degrees and you know, the Pacific Northeast, which has been <laughs> happening. And uh, you just go down the road to the farmer's market, get some really good kind of like mustard flavored greens, crunchy vegetables, get the best vegetables you can. 
and then go to your seafood market. You know, a lot of seafood markets are carrying more and more. They're carrying high end tin seafood. Yes. You can also go to your regular supermarket. Get some smoked oysters. Get some smoked trout. Get some, you know, herring if you're into that. Sardines. All these things. Um, open some tins. Keep them in the tins. And then Very serve cool. with some really good pickles. I got a whole bunch of pickles in the back of the book. So yes, you do. I, yeah, love I love love pickles. And um, and then you know serve them with the greens and maybe some mustard and hot sauce and then some just really good crackers, crusty baguette. You got it made and have a really nice wine with it. Oh my God! And look at that. Like it just, uh, it's just beautiful. Your book is just beautiful. You've got all these like it's just. It just, the food looks vibrant, the photographs are vibrant, the flavors look vibrant, and you've got all these like great tips uh, and sort of techniques for, look at those peaches. You got some Georgia, I know, I bet those aren't Georgia peaches, but where those are Those are main peaches. Those yeah, are main peaches. peaches. I know, I always used to get so uh, just amused. I don't know how to put it any other way. Cause like the Massachusetts peach season when I was living in Massachusetts is yeah. like that long, right? <laughs> Well, and you can imagine the meat season. It's like, like little, it's a millimeter. It's like this, it's like this little itty bitty season and this little itty bitty peach. But you yeah, know, we, like, we shot that. That photo was shot at a, a good friend's house. They had a pool, and we just rigged it up, and you know, we got the, we got in there with the peaches, and we just, you know, shot it, and yeah. So this is so cool. So let's talk a little bit. Okay, we got July 4th weekend coming up. And um, are there some recipes? Are there some sort of some ideas that you'd like to share with anybody? And y'all, if y'all, anyone's got any questions, please let me know. Is there um, some recipes that you'd like? Uh, I like all of them. Weekend? <laughs> Say again? Books, I like all the recipes. I know, I know, I know, I know. Okay, let me think about this. Okay, so I would start maybe with... Um, Actually, I was going to demo this, but I'm going to say start with maybe the ceviche if you have some really good seafood. Um, it's a scallop ceviche that has lime and avocado, cilantro, um, and that can be made, made ahead of time and then just like served in little glasses. Um, you could do it. So let's talk about, let me, let me, let's talk for a second though, because I did see something earlier this week in Serious Eats. Um, about ceviche. And I think it's a wonderful, it is a wonderful dish. And I remember like a million years ago when I came back from Mexico, I made it and my roommates in college, my roommates were all like, what are you doing? Right? Like people don't understand it, that the, that the acid denatures the protein. So let's yes. talk a little bit about that so that people will understand that they're not eating bait. Right. Exactly. I mean, it does denature the protein. Um, you, but you do want to make sure you get the best quality seafood yeah. when you're going to make it. It has to be super, super fresh because the citric acid, it, it kind of cooks the seafood, but it doesn't get rid of all the bacteria. So you want to right. just make sure, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend this for pregnant women, for example. Right, right, right. right? But it does essentially cook the seafood. Um, it's um and it's so good and you can make it and the whole nature of it is like making it ahead. So part of part of your book is to is telling people sort of making things ahead, putting things in the refrigerator, room temperature, how to keep the heat out of the kitchen, right? Exactly. You know, so when you're working in a professional kitchen, you're always thinking ahead, how to prep, yeah. how to mise en place, how to get everything ready ahead of time. Um, so there's a little bit of that in this act in this book, but it's really so that people can make foods when it's not too hot out yet. Plan ahead. Yeah. You know, look at the weather. If it's going to be really hot, but it's not quite yet, maybe make, you can, you know, I have some breakfast recipes that you can make ahead of time. Like I have um, the no-bake almond butter, cherry dark chocolate, and marcona almond granola bars, which you could make ahead of time. I want chocolate for breakfast. I think that that needs to be instituted. That would make oh, everything yeah. be very okay. Yeah. Um, and I also have, oh, this one, where is it? Oh, the passion fruit mango coconut parfaits. That's mm. page 19. Those are really good. That has like a oh, I know. The they photography. Pretty yummy. You can have those for dessert too. No, I know. And the photography is just so beautiful. Everything is just so bright. Um, and you've got some great information to hear about like what to do with a rotisserie chicken, which 
face it, I swear to goodness, I think like even Thomas Keller picks up a rotisserie chicken oh, sometimes, yeah. you know, like yeah. it's a lifesaver. There's no shame. There shouldn't be no any shame. Zero no. shame. No. Zero no. shame. No. So I offer ideas and suggestions for what to do with that rotisserie chicken to, you can buy one or two and then uh -huh. you don't have to just think of it as like basic rotisserie chicken with a couple sides. You can actually pull it apart and do a lot of right. things with it. And it really I saves you. And I know you've got off. green smash, Vietnamese street food, chicken soup, quicker Sharma, picnic, pasta. Um, I mean, it's really, I think that it's so smart. I mean, I remember when I was a little girl, because my grandparents, when, when I was a very little girl, they didn't have air conditioning in their house. And so, I mean, it's hot as blue blazes in Georgia in July and August, right? And so my grandmother, she would wake up really early in the morning and do the cooking for the day when it was still cool. And then we would sort of eat more room temperature stuff. We wouldn't necessarily eat like a hot, a hot, you know, midday meal. Right. Um, yeah, it, was, exactly. it, was, it was more like room temperature, which I, I shudder to think about the food safety aspects of that now. Cause I know that my grandmother wasn't paying attention to it, but I've turned out okay. But you know, I mean, like part of it is like being sensible and, and when to cook, right? Yeah, exactly. Planning ahead. Um, yeah. And like my soup chapter, they're all kind of room temperature or you could serve them cold. You could even serve them warm if you wanted to soups, but I developed a technique for creating all of my soups that use less heat on the stove, less time, and you still have to get the full, quality and flavor and texture of a velvety soup. So it's so wonderful. And you know what? This is, I'm just gonna sort of say it and it's like and inadvertently patting me on the back too. Food editors think about stuff like this. Like people yeah. who've worked in the food industry in the magazine and the media section, the cookbook authors, the food editors, the people that are trying to get everyday people to cook. Mm -hmm. I feel like we think about these things. Right. Because we're oh, just definitely. we're trying to get regular. <laughs> right. We're trying to get regular people to cook the food that they want to eat. And sometimes I think that like uh, it that may not be at the front of the mind of, say, like a restaurant chef with a cookbook. Right. Like you're you're it's clear to me that all these beautiful recipes, chocolate panna cotta with salty praline peanut crumble. Oh, my God. Um, your this your your hip, your tips and techniques. It's all about like how to get people in and out of the kitchen, how to get people in and out of the kitchen. Yeah, I just care about that stuff. I'm always pushing my husband to learn more about cooking. And, you know, I just I, I really want people to learn skills. It's the teacher side of me. Yeah, um, I like I like explaining things and I like learning about things myself. I'm always educating myself more. There's always something new to learn. I know. And I, I mean, you and I both, both taught at Stanwall Kitchen in Maine. And I yeah, find yeah. sometimes um, with the uh, cooking classes, I learn as much from my students asking questions, right? Like it, I mean, it's a, it's a two way street, those classes. It's not just us giving information. It's us like understanding that someone might have a question that we had never thought about before. Yeah. And yeah. you know what? I, I have a mental bank. I keep them up in there. And so when I'm writing, this is my second cookbook, but yep. when I'm writing cookbooks, I think about, um, although I think about those questions and I think yep. about what people really want to learn. And, and ultimately the goal of writing the book is, is, you know, A, I want it to be beautiful also, you know, also, um, but I also really want it to be a good book that teaches people about right. cooking. That's really oh my gosh. I love this too. Infused ice cubes. So you've got jolt, Ice cubes, that's frozen coffee, dreamy, creamy, dreamy, sweet and condensed milk, spa cubes, lemon and cucumber, flower power. And then I think this might be my favorite, actually, the Mary Poppins. Hey, why not? Um, pop them, yeah, pop them in a Bloody Mary. <laughs> tell us, tell us, it says a uh, horseradish, tomato juice, and freeze. Mm -hmm. That's so smart. Hey, why not? Yeah. No. So y'all, I'm here with Vanessa Cedar and we're talking about Eat, her beautiful book by Rizzoli called Eat Cool. You can go to my Instagram uh, feed and look for the cover of this book and 
follow all the instructions like Vanessa, like me, tag a friend, and you can enter to win a copy of this book. So Vanessa, you have some ingredients there. Are you going to show us? Um, I think yeah. you were talking about ceviche. Will you show us how to make that, please? I will definitely do that. It's so simple. And this is a really great dish to make when it's super hot because you can, it's one of those dishes in the book where you can make it ahead of time when it's not as hot yet and then just set it up and eat it later. Um, so to start, uh, I have some fresh, dry sea scallops. You want to make sure that the sea scallops that you purchase are the dry ones. The wet mm -hmm. ones are soaked in a sulfate solution. And so you're mm -hmm. paying for the weight of the liquid. And yes. It helps preserve them, but uh, if they're not as fresh. They don't taste as good. So man, Maine, Maine has eat. some vicious, wicked, yummy scallops. That's for sure. Oh, man. Yeah. Maine has such good scallops. We are very lucky here. So I'm just going to cut these into half inch pieces to start and put them in a bowl. And I'll just keep holding it up. Because yeah. <laughs> you see my surface, can you? <laughs> now, so, but if you, yeah. So, but, and like, but talk to us if folks don't have access to those beautiful Maine sea scallops, can they use something else? Yeah. I mean, you can make uh, ceviche with other seafood as well, whatever you can find. You just want to make sure that you buy the best quality seafood um, because as we talked about it denatures mm -hmm. uh, that changes the protein structure it helps cook the seafood cook it but um you still have the bacteria so you want to make sure it's like super super fresh as local as you can get the best um and then it starts the process of cooking in a citrus juice so yep. i'm gonna add my lime juice this is about yeah. a cup of fresh squeezed lime juice so I was researching this recipe and, or not this one, but just ceviche, and it's very old, you know, it's, it's kind of Incan in a way. It started uh -huh. in South America um, thousands of years ago, mainly in Peru, and then the popularity spread. And they used indigenous fruits and, and citrus, or not citrus, like, like indigenous fruits that had acid to, right. to start the process. But then the Spanish brought over the citrus fruit. Ah. Yeah, I just love learning stuff like that. Okay, so I have some thinly sliced red onion. I'm gonna uh -huh. add. So this is gonna kind of cook. This takes about four hours. I did a bunch of tests on this, and this is the the time that I really liked on this. Uh huh. So, you know, you're gonna pickle those um, peppers and onions in the citrus as it cooks. So I'm gonna put that to the side. Um, so then through the magic of the iPad, <laughs> I have some that is cooked. You can see, I'm going to just, I, my hands are clean. Yeah, so I have, this is a raw sea scallop. Uh -huh. And then I have here, I have a cooked sea scallop. Can yep. you tell? It's like a yeah. raw but so, so y'all, what's happened there is the proteins are these long sort of wavy strands, right? And then we keep talking about denaturing. And when they denature, what they do is they shrink. So just like when you cook meat, it shrinks, the protein shrinks. So Vanessa just showed us a sea scallop that was raw with the long protein strands. Yeah. And then the smaller one where the protein strands it sh had shrank. Right. So these, this is a full whole scallop and this is sliced too, mm -hmm. just so you know. Yeah. The, the thing is, so it does firm up. You want to make sure you don't overdo it because you don't want to have seafood that's overly rubbery and, and right. hard. Right. So, okay. So it has so, to be that perfect time. So four hours is your sweet spot. Yeah. How okay. how how long would you say is too long? Um, I tried six hours. That was way too long. I just the thing is, it depends. It depends on the seafood you're using. Right. How long and the cut of the seafood. So each, everything you're going to do is different and you just have to kind of test it a little bit. Right. You can look at it, you can see visually of what it looks like. When it looks cooked enough, you can even taste it to see yep. if it's cooked through enough. You just want to make sure that it's not overly cooked. That's really right. important here. Or, or, I mean, I would say it's better to undercook than overcook, but right. it also depends on the seafood and parasites and, you know, whatever yeah. it is you're using. No, I've, that's one of my most favorite expressions. You can always cook, but you can't uncook. Totally. It's like salt, right? Yeah. So, okay. So I'm going to take this and I have a fine mesh strainer. Uh -huh. I'm going to strain it into that. Okay. Yeah. Once it's strained, you're going to discard the lime juice that you were using for the seafood. Okay. And you're going to put this in a new bowl. 
And uh -huh. oh, the other thing I should mention, it should be a non-reactive bowl because you're using right. a lot of acid here with your seafood. Um, okay, so at this point, what we're gonna do add the rest of our ingredients. Okay. We have some some peeled and cubed um, avocado. That's okay. really nice and ripe. Yum. Who doesn't want like avocado? Yeah, and do you know this trick about the avocado, the belly button at the top? Yeah, you tell people. It? Yeah, if you peel it and it's like a nice light green color, that means it's perfectly ripe. So being somebody from California originally, I care a lot about the avocado. <laughs> and you don't want to bruise this poor baby, right? You want yeah. to take care of it? Yeah. Okay, so we have that. I have some lime um, that I... Oops, I segmented. So this is peeled lime. Nice. And then I went and I segmented the lime. Yummy. So that goes in. And you still have the chilies and the um, onion in there. And then a ton of cilantro. I know some people are super tasters and they don't like cilantro, but I like cilantro. You can always add a different herb to this if you want. Mm -hmm. Like you could add um Parsley or chervil or yeah, parsley would be yeah, parsley so innocuous, but that would go well, right? Yeah. Okay. So then I have my fat. I'm gonna add some good olive oil. Now I have an aunt who lives near Paso Robles in California, and so what? I am lucky enough. She sends me these beautiful olive oils that come out of there. So we we use really good olive oil in our house. We eat well in this house. Yeah, you do. This is good olive oil. This is called, uh, this is Pasolivo olive oil. Nice. Yeah, that goes in here. Just a good glug of that. And then just some really good sea salt. Uh, I just have some malt in here. We have great mm -hmm. sea salt here in Maine. Just a nice Yes, you, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And then you just toss it. And look at that. It's oh so my good. gosh, I, I want that for lunch. Yeah, and then um, if you want, you can serve it with some chips. It's the finished. It's that looks so good. Oh my gosh, that looks, I love that idea. I love the freshness of it. I think that you're smart about like other substitutions and stuff and um, and then like taking it and then adding some more things to it. So it's not just like uh, the seafood that's like marinated or, you know, in the acid, but you're adding those crunchy vegetables and you know, it's a really, it's, it's always, it's so nice to eat something cold when it's hot. It is. And this is great because you're getting your protein, you're getting your healthy fats, you're getting some heat from the chilies, which actually can help you cool down as ultimately. Yep. And then just really fresh quality herbs. It's just delicious. I mean, we're going to be having this for lunch today. Man, I know. I wish I could come <laughs> over, honey. That's for sure. So y'all, I have been talking with Vanessa Cedar, uh, the author of Eat Cool, Hot, Good Food for Hot Days, 100 Easy, Satisfying, and Refreshing Recipes That Won't Heat Up Your Kitchen. Vanessa, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. This is uh, Yeah, so I've got a couple of questions that I want to ask you yeah. before I let you go. So one of the things that I always ask is, what is a cookbook that you have cooked from or been reading other than your own? Okay, so um, I would say um, I love Diana Kennedy. Yeah. Um, Sonoko Sakai, I believe that's how you pronounce her name. Uh -huh. um, she, she has this Japanese home cooking book, which is excellent. Um, and Night and Market, which is kind of like Thai, Vietnamese, you know, and inspired by those regions. No, that's wonderful. Well, I think, like I've said a couple of times, y'all, this book has got a lot of international influences. So there's, it's just a, it's just a, a smattering around the world, right? Which is so lovely to be able to have a book that's sort of one-stop shopping for things like that. Now we do have a question that I want to scoosh in here. Are there a couple of good recipes for salad dressings that can maybe also be used with crudite? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I'm just trying to think. I mean, this this book of my there are great salad dressings that are paired with uh -huh. salads already. Yeah. So I would recommend going to the salad chapter yeah. and just looking those recipes up and you can see the different dressings that correspond to those. But I do also have a sauce cookbook. That was my other cookbook. I was going to say, yeah, there you go. And that has a bunch of dressings in it as well that pair nicely with recipes. No, and you've got, uh, in, in here, you've got a honey lemon vinaigrette, a creamy tahini. Those would both be good with crudite. And then under yeah. sauces, 
There's a cucumber radish mignonette. That might be nice. An herby pea stew and an orange uh, sesame and chili dipping sauce. So both all of those um, sound fantastic. All yeah. right. So on that note, Vanessa, what is your favorite cooking tool? Oh, I'm going to go with a knife. A knife. I love, I love good knives. Oh, I'll good. Go with a knife and the small offset spatula because I'm going to do two. I, I think that's it. I know if we're gonna, if you have to go to a desert island, I believe that you're do more than one cooking tool, right? I think Completely. that you can you have to have two cooking tools on a desert island. I know, I know, I know. Okay, so sour, salty, bitter, sweet, or savory. What's your go-to flavor? I'm gonna I'm a Libra and so I can't decide. So I'm gonna go with all of them and I love a good balance. <laughs> I am not answering that question. I'm going with all of them. Well, there you go. You were definitely the first person that has taken taken on, um, um, taken taken that approach. But I agree, right? If you have one, you need the other. You know. Totally. Um. All right. So, so who is someone that you like to watch? Maybe on a device, on a TV, on an iPad, on a whatever. Who is someone okay. that you like to watch um, for inspiration? Right. I was saying before. You know, we don't have normal. Tele we just have like Amazon and Netflix in our house. Uh -huh. We've had it for years. So I do watch videos on YouTube a lot. And I've fallen in love with this Chinese woman who's, I think it's like Liz, Liziki. I'm probably, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. I don't know how to pronounce it. It's L-I-Z-I-Q-I. L-I-Z-I-Q-I. Yeah. And I just absolutely love her videos. Um, they're beautiful. Um, she takes things from raw stages and just trans poses them into like these gorgeous, you know, meals and saves things for the winter. I mean, it, they're just stunning and you don't have to speak Chinese. To that's so wonderful. And that's what's so exciting because I used to say like, what's your favorite cooking show? And it's like, whatever. There's so many different ways to absorb content, whether it's a reel or a YouTube or something like that. Yeah. And there are all these like incredible creators, like all over the, all over the world, right. That are giving yeah. us all inspiration. Yeah. So, I mean, we're, we're lucky. We're, I mean, during this time of COVID, you know, we're lucky that we still have access to the world in some ways, because imagine yeah. if this had happened in the eighties, you know, when we have a fax machine. So no, that's that's so true. There's so much that would or people working from home, right? Like all the, all that would have been yeah, yeah, catastrophic. Yeah. So, all right. So uh, let's hope maybe we'll maybe this will like sort of wrap it back to like a really positive note. So oh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, one yeah. of your um, <laughs> no no no. It's dangerous talking about COVID. So what is one of your favorite cooking memories? Okay, I would. I'm gonna tie this up a little bit. Huh? So um. I would say it's, uh, I grew up in Los Angeles. My grandmother was born there. So I'm a, like a true Los Angelino who lives in Maine. It just happened. But I used to make deviled eggs for all of her parties growing up. She used to have all these parties. So I love making deviled eggs mm -hmm. and eating them. And I have a whole page, or is it two pages, devoted to deviled eggs and, con you know, like different variations that you can make. And I just find they always go, at a party very quickly people oh my god they're just happy you know like, they're happy people deviled love eggs. deviled eggs people yeah. love deviled eggs and it it's super it's super good it's super great cool food there's no doubt about it well that is that is so cool i am so thankful and so grateful for you being a guest on cookbooks with virginia today thank you so much for having me virginia this is yes. so cool. yay. Yay. yay cool so y'all if you want to find out more about vanessa go to her website let me see if i can put that up yep there we go we're gonna go oh they're gonna go there yep all right awesome vanessa thank you much so much for joining me thank you so much for having me talk soon bye okay, bye Y'all, wasn't that fun? So, okay, Eat Cool is the book. Eat, be cool, eat cool. Um, go to, you can go to my Instagram feed and look for the cover of this book to win a copy. You can go to my website, virginiawills.com to learn more about Cookbooks with Virginia. You can learn more about Vanessa at vanessacedar.com. And um, once again, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you later. Okay, bon appetit, y'all. Bye-bye now.